Code Fun Podcast Network. This podcast is brought to you by our friends at Linode. Whether you're working on a personal project or managing your enterprise's infrastructure, Linode has the pricing, support, and scale you need to take your project to the next level. Get started on Linode today by going to linode.com slash remote ruby. This is Remote Ruby. Have you any remote idea to the meaning of the word? Hey guys. Hey, hey. Howdy. How how are y'all? Not too bad, not too bad. I'm getting a little antsy again being mm-hmm. in the house, but I've been trying to go for more walks. The nice part is the weather's getting good, so bust out the grill, do a brisket or something for like eight hours this weekend in the smoker. So hopefully, you know, feel a little bit less cooped up. How about you guys? I am just so upset because it's finally like in the 80s and 90s here and I want to go surfing. (laughs) Yeah. Is that like our beaches closed? Yeah. Well, I I don't know what this means exactly, but they said the beach strand is closed. And strand. Yeah. I don't know. I took oceanography. I have no idea what that word means, but I'm pretty sure they don't want you going on the beach. Yeah, our parks here were open and they were like encouraging people to go out to the parks and, you know, do stuff and walk your dog and whatever. And then like today they're like, no, like way too many people are going out to parks, so we need to close them. The mayor of Memphis did a Facebook Live video and was like, I'm going to close all the parks if I see what happened downtown yesterday. Because there was like everybody, like downtown's on the Mississippi River. And so everybody was out, like, and there were tons of people. And so sure enough, yeah, he is shutting all that stuff down. Because, like, I don't know, people just people just are still getting out and acting like it's no big thing. So I have a, a simpler and more rude way to say that is that there's a lot of stupid people out there. <laughs> I don't know. It's tough. There's a lot of people that want to, I don't know, They're they're not used to it. Like we are sitting at home and and coding, you know? So I imagine it's pretty weird of a change for anyone who like always goes out and is now stuck at home. We have it pretty easy over here, all things considered, because like Shannon's already home with the boys. But there's a lot of people like my sister who has like a six-year-old and a 10-year-old and she's having to still teach throughout the week and then help her kids do school and her husband still going into work. So like, yeah, I feel for the people that it has royally complicated their life right now. Yeah. It sounds, it was a busy time then. I'm sure. I don't know if I've ever told you all this, but I was homeschooled for many, many years, which is why I'm so weird. (laughs) And I feel Equally for the parents and children of everyone who's now having to get homeschooled because that sucks. I was not a fan. My homeschool experience wasn't too bad, but I only homeschooled in high school. And basically homeschooling just gave me more freedom than I had. Yeah, I was homeschooled from second grade until high school. And I went to public high school. That was a... Jarring because I went to private <laughs> school, then homeschooled for like what eight years or whatever almost, and then public high school. One thing that's been kind of like I don't want to use the word nice because there's not like this isn't a nice situation, but being home more uh, has given me more time and more freedom to code. And Shannon's pretty cool with it because you know, like we see each other all the time right now. So if I want to sit on the couch, put my computer out, she's like, cool, whatever, I'll just watch. Watch Have TV. you been building anything fun? So I think I talked about my neighbor, the thing called neighbor I built last time. And we've made some improvements to that. We have like 86 teams using it right now, 86 organizations. And so we've got feedback, but that's mostly like the most crud app you could build. I did find a thing that was relevant to our conversation last week about filtering you know like when we were doing filter we do like table filtering so essentially like reorder by something but 
have you heard of now Heart Combo used to be Platform Attacks has scope, Jim? It sounds really familiar. I don't think I ever used it though. So if you yeah, define, same. you know, like model scopes, you can use this gym in your controller and you can say has scope, the name of the scope. And like you define all the scopes you want to use. And then you say apply scopes, give it the model. And it just automatically does all that. I think it's pretty cool. And it like... Oh, uh, I see. Yeah, because I've written that before where it's like, if this you know field is filled out, then apply this scope, and then you you just end up with it like a chain of conditionals or something in your right. index action. That's kind of cool. Like you know, applies all those things for you, so you don't have to really clutter your index action with all that. Yeah. And you don't even really have to clutter any of your code with that because you know I've I've taken the approach of like. I don't know. What was it? Like a a class method or something like a filter on my model that you would pass the params into and it would do, it would just simply move that code out of the controller into the model. It was fine, but you know, it, it, it was just annoying to have to maintain that too. But it's kind of cool to have a reusable thing. And it's probably just, you know, like a concern almost. And that's probably the better place to put that code because it's not really, I don't know, it's probably more controller code than it is model code. Like it doesn't belong in the model because it's looking at params, but then you don't want to have that in your controller. So probably something like this or a concern makes you to put that. I like it. Yeah. Um, it doesn't solve like necessarily all the problems we were talking about with filtering because like we're going up and down in a table, right? So like we're changing the order. But it's, it's definitely like a huge piece of that code. It's pretty cool. Yeah, because you, I guess you could kind of do that maybe because it looks like they have a by period example here that takes a hash or something of arguments. So you might be able to, to do something like that where as long as you pass in the correct you know argument name, it'll pass it and forward it along for you and then you could do your ordering that way. Yeah. So... Yeah, that's pretty cool. Neat. Oh, and it looks like this featured one will cast it to a Boolean for you, which is also super nice because that was something I was like having to do in in the sorting code that I added to the jumpstart scaffolds. This is pretty nifty. I like this. Makes me like, you know, I don't remember. I think most of it I did put directly in the controller and the index, but now it makes me want to go like refactor that code into either using this or build my own little concern. Seems nicely organized this way. Yeah, I like this. I don't know how I came across it, but I was like, oh, I, yeah, it's cool. And I don't know how I've never heard about it. but Yeah, I, I, I remember seeing it now and I'm sure that it's in my like never ending Trello board of go rail screencast ideas. I'm pretty sure it's in there somewhere, but it's fallen down the list and I forgot all about it. Speaking of fun side projects, did you guys see that Twilio and dev.2 are doing a hackathon? No, that sounds fun. What's the deal with that? So, Here, I am putting the link in the show notes. So it's basically a partnership hackathon, I guess, where they're offering a lot of prizes. And you need to use at least one of Twilio's APIs. And I think you need to connect it to another API. And so they have a few categories of projects that they're looking for. But the prizes are pretty good. And if you have a valid submission, you get a $50 credit to the dev.2 shop. Oh, that's solid. Sounds like fun. Sweatpants in my future. So are you... Do you have an idea that you want to do? I have had several terrible ideas. I'm hoping (laughs) that y'all have ideas. (laughs) Because Mm -hmm. I've been trying to outsource the idea part because ideas aren't really... I have just generally bad ideas constantly. (laughs) Constantly bad ideas. Yeah, that's interesting. I haven't done anything with SMS or phone calls for a long time. We did have some apps that I did like 
in my consulting days where we use Twilio for some stuff. But yeah, that's an interesting thing. I'll have to think on some ideas. I think one of my friends mentioned some, he had an idea for like, uh, it, like he's in, in restaurants. So what if you could pay your bar tab from your phone? So like you could just like give them, how was it? You give them your credit card at the bar and they give you your card back. So you don't ever just forget it. And then they can like text you at the end of the night if you forgot to pay. And then you could just do it on a link on your phone or something. That would be nice. Kind of fun. Yeah. As someone who has left their card downtown more than I'm willing to admit, <laughs> dude, they're not. I if I was the restaurant, I would not be giving that up because they take a gratuity if you leave it. Mm, yeah, I was gonna say like, how do you just have people not ignore it? You know, so yeah, they give themselves like ten bucks when you like return the card, and you're like, oh, thanks for yeah. literally doing nothing. Yeah. yeah. I'm you interested. took up space in our car, credit card box and it's worth 10, worth 10 bucks. <laughs> I really want to do something. And one thing I was thinking about is that it would be fun to maybe do a few of these almost, like a, get find people with ideas. And basically, I threw this out on Twitter earlier too. I offered to pair with people if they wanted to, or if they had like an idea that they wanted to build in Rails. and my intention would be to like to live stream or record those. So it would just be like a fun resource. I don't know. I've been thinking about getting, start streaming some a little bit, but my foot is in my mouth pretty much all day long. So we'll have to see how that goes. (laughs) Yeah. I've been thinking about doing some streaming stuff too. And I've liked watching Adam Lathan and other people you know, stream for an hour or two at a time and just work on something. I need to do yeah. that. I just like, I don't know. It feels like I have to be more ready to go do that. Like pick something specific to work on or whatever. And I usually just like sit down and I'm like, which of these 500 things that I need to do, do, do I feel like doing? So yeah, I don't know. That'd be fun. We should maybe make a, a schedule for that or something just to like force ourselves to do it. Yeah, I was going to say, you sound willing. Yeah, we should definitely schedule some time and pound a nap out or something. Of course, the invitation sends you to Jason. I think it'd be cool. Yeah. I've been thinking about that recently. Also, just in case you haven't added this to your super long list of Go Rails ideas, view component, which was action view component from GitHub, went through the change of, you know, changing their gem name and kind of doing some upgrades to now that they're not going to be like in Rails Master. Mm-hmm. And I actually got a commit in there too, but it was fixing CI, which is literally the only thing I'm good for. <laughs> I, I swear, I I can fix CI and I can do it well and I can do everything else about half-assed, but I can fix some CI. If you ever um, need to start a consulting company, that's all you do is we'll fix your CI. <laughs> yeah, I'll speed up your CI for sure. But they did all those changes. They've got collection support now, which is something that a lot of people were waiting for. And this morning or kind of this afternoon, I got storybook running with the latest like changes. Oh, cool. So that collection thing you just mentioned, that's like the, you know, render at users. You can kind of throw the same thing in and uh Render collection of components? Yeah, I think that's what it is. Hold on. Something like that. Well, you know, there's like a render thing you can do in Rails, like render collection or whatever it is. Yeah, right. I think it's basically the equivalent of that. Yeah, you can do render product component with collection products. Okay. Cool. That's pretty cool. That'll be really handy. Yeah. And Nate and I have been like teeter tottering on view component for a while, but I wasn't like after like it wasn't going into rails. Like I even started questioning it a little bit and mostly because there was a lot of changes that had to get, you know, done, but I think they're at a pretty good place. And I was talking to Nate yesterday and he is ready to start pulling it into code fund. So now I've got the 
storybook stuff running. So I think I'm going to have to say goodbye to my beautiful, beautiful helper framework, move to something better. Oh, cool. I'm excited to hear how your experience is with it. I can, I don't know. I'm curious, like, you know, I wonder if the render collection will implement, like, do you, do you implement caching around the component stuff or is it built in to the component rendering and that sort of thing? Like there's probably a bunch of little questions to figure out as you go through it. But presumably since they're using it at GitHub, that stuff's already been thought out pretty well. So yeah, I'll be curious to see how it goes for you guys. And I need to need to do a screencast on it. I'm excited to finally publish one that I made a quick intro to Stimulus Reflex the other day, last week. So that'll be a good one to get released. But yeah, there's there's too many too many new things to cover. Andrew, tell me more about uh, getting Storybook wired up with it. I'm curious how that went. Pain in the uh, arm. What I would expect. But it, it's funny because I actually joked like, oh, we should try and get this in Storybook at Podia. Like we don't use Storybook. But I was like, ha, ha, ha. And then you've actually done it. So I want to know. Well, you did it. I don't want to take much, if any, credit for this. There was someone who did it originally like a few months ago but it didn't work and i tried in vain to get that working again and i i just couldn't figure out what was going on and then i saw on a pull request someone was trying to add support they were trying to surface something up in the components and the reasoning for it was is that if that change was added then it would be easier to like do some more stuff like with the like knobs, I think is what they're called. It'd be easier to use like knobs in Storybook. And if you want me to tell you what knobs are, I don't know. So that's a Google. But I remember specifically it was knobs because I was like, (laughs) knob. So basically what it is, is you set up Storybook and the setup is different than it would be with like a React app, which is kind of... It, there's like zero documentation really around. I mean, I mean, there is, but not really. Like I found like the TypeScript definitions like more helpful than some of the docs I found online. But you install your dependencies and then you, I, you create like a different layout file for it. And what it does is it basically is running like the, uh, the component previews that you create in your test file and it's running those in a, through a route like through a controller route and then there's this weird js erp hacky thing that someone magically i don't know how they got it to work but somehow this weird hacky G, js erp thing someone figured out works so that you can grab all of the components and pipe them into storybook basically as HTML. Really cool. Yeah, that was a terrible explanation of it because I barely understand. But no, I mean, I I was going to say, do you want to describe what Storybook is for anybody that doesn't know what it is? Yeah, Jason explained it last week, I believe. But basically, Storybook is a JavaScript like centered tool to it's like a UI component explorer. So it basically helps you build components and it, it gives you like a nice UI to like, you can see all your components and you can view the code. If you install these super wonky add-ons that don't make any sense that I'm currently having struggles with, but you can, you know, write notes on them, accessibility stuff. You can add, basically document your components. And I, I really like it. And one thing I found is I had never used it before. But I installed it on the, I'm sort of building like a new Gatsby site for a code fund for our marketing site. I think we talked about this a week or two ago. And I added Storybook on that. And what I found like just a, which is weird because like I wouldn't have thought or known to do this, but instead of developing like the app, just like slapping code on the screen, like I normally do, I was actually developing the components inside of Storybook, basically. 
So like creating the components and using Storybook to kind of test them and experiment with them and like, you know, pass some different data. Like if you have a card component, you know, this is what it looks like without a header. This is what it looks like without the body. And then you can add prop types or arguments or whatever you want to call them, et cetera, et cetera. It's a, it's a really cool tool. It's definitely, I think it's definitely a productivity booster. I found myself, if, if not more productive, at least like the architecture of like the view was like in front the entire time instead of me just like copying something out of Tailwind UI and just pasting it. So yeah, that's what Storybook is. And it would be really nice if we can leverage it the way some of these React people are leveraging it in with Action View component. And I think it will, I don't know, it's, it's a cool tool. And it's also really helpful. Like we have an open source project. So if someone wants to like add something to the code, it's not really like in terms of the view, because it's not even super clear to us sometimes like, oh, what's like, is this supposed to be a header or like, how is the card structured? Like how much margin do I put here? Like we basically cowboy code a lot of that, which is why I added that helper framework basically in the beginning anyway. But Eric hates it. Eric hates it so much with the greatest of passions. This reminds me a little bit of the, I wish Rails had a better, well, I I don't even know if it's been worked on much, but you know, the Rails conductor that was kind of, talked about for yeah. Rails 6.1, like we have the mailer previews routes in development, but you can't, you have to go define the preview. And I don't think you can, you know, define any arguments to them, but it'd be kind of nice if you could just pass in something from the the web UI and, and change the, the arguments or something as you went to test your email for different, you know, examples or whatever. But then the, what is it? The action mailbox ones, they do actually mm-hmm. have a form you can submit stuff to. So it's like a really nice version of that. Is what Storybook sounds like, which I would love to have more tools like that in, in Rails itself. That was kind of the, you know, intention for the jumpstart config UI where we're like, I don't really want to have to go write a YAML file and you know, figure out what are valid things and whatever. So it's way easier to interact with it in your browser only in development. So it'd be sweet to have more of that stuff. I always so, I just thought like too, like if you could define routes or something yeah, as like, you know, instead of in development when there was like a, a missing route, it could be like a button you click, like we'll go to define that route in the controller for you too, if you want. It'd be kind of sweet. So one really nice thing that got added to action or I guess just view component pretty much like one of the like first things that was added to it, I feel like that I saw was integrating the view component previews into Rails Conductor. So in development, you can actually go to this like slash Rails slash view component or whatever, and it'll show all your components that you have created previews for in your tests. Which is it all like and Storybook is also using those components that you define in your test. So I think if anything, like some of the like tools that people are starting to create around the view component, I definitely see like it they're kind of coming out of the testing area. So it's kind of interesting to see testing. It seems to be like a very first concern almost, and which I wouldn't typically think of in terms of like designing the view, but People are writing pretty good tests for these components. Yeah, it seems like, you know, when you start out and you don't know how to write tests, you're going to like build it and then make it work and then work towards your tests. And maybe this is a way to like blend those two together versus like TDD, you know, so it's kind of a, a middle ground between them. So you can, you can go either direction you want but you always have an easy way to interact with it, which is like, you know, the big complaint of testing is like you spend so much time setting up your tests. And then at some point you're like not even quite sure if it's testing what you think it's supposed to be. So narrowing it down to this component, here's all the state that it runs on and whatever, you know for sure that that's working, right? Because it's nice, like compact little unit. 
to work with. So yeah, it, it seems like a really great direction to be going for programming, really, you know, it's more towards the, I wouldn't really call it no code, but it's like in that direction, you know, it makes it more accessible. And, you know, even if you are good at development, this is probably still going to save you a bunch of time to go, you know, make sure everything works correctly. I like it. Yeah. And before we move away from this topic, I did want to mention that I'm going to butcher his last name, but Dave Paola, I think. I've met him through Twitter. I guess you could say met, but he's actually, and I don't, I actually somehow stumbled upon this while digging through like projects that depended on view component in the first place. But he's working on a bootstrap component library implemented in view component. Yeah, I saw that in Twitter and we briefly chatted over email with that about that too. So I saw that got merged or something recently in the last day or two, which is awesome because that was like, you know, a great idea for if you could build that for heck, you could do one for Tailwind UI or something that's like, here's your if you want to do a, a modal you know, pass in these options and fill this stuff out and we'll take care of the styling and, you know, standardize that stuff, which is really sweet. Yeah. That'll be, that'll be a great example showcase for what you can do with that. I think. Yeah. I, I had actually thought about doing that and I was so glad that someone else was doing it. And I am planning to, now that I've gotten a bit more, Hands on with it now that we're going to be using it in Code Fun. And Code Fun is Bootstrap. It's, a, I don't want to talk about Bootstrap and Code Fun. I tried to purge CSS, the Bootstrap Code Fun stuff. And I don't know why it, it worked in development. And no matter what I did, it would not work in Heroku. I did like it wouldn't, everything, I thought. What part wouldn't work? Like it wouldn't compile or something? It, it wasn't respecting my settings. Like oh, that I was setting strange. for, so I had it in post CSS at first, and it wasn't respecting the settings I was giving it. Because if I use purge CSS with no settings, I got the same behavior locally that I got on staging. So it wasn't respecting the post CSS settings. So I was like, okay, instead I'll do this in Webpack. So which was a pain to figure out, but I got I got it all working in Webpack, like in your environment JS file, basically. Yeah, that's how I and have it set up. That wouldn't work either. Huh. Like it works weirdly, but right when it went up to GitHub or to Roku, I guess when it pre compiled the assets, it's just not, I don't know. I got really frustrated with that. Huh. Yeah, I've had multiple moments of deploying something and then like it's not visible and it just like stripped out all my CSS that, you know, if you, if you use like a JavaScript video player or something and you're not careful with importing their CSS or whatever, like, yeah, you're going to be in for a bad time with purge CSS. But for the most yeah. part, it's pretty awesome. Yeah. But the part I was pissed off about, other than the fact that it, I couldn't get it to work, I'm sure I could get it to work if I kept going at it. But our, we have like, Eric bought like a bootstrap theme. Mm -hmm. So we have like some vendor theme CSS file that's, freaking the size of China and none of their, you know, none of their jQuery JavaScript stuff works. So we've basically been, anytime we find something we need to do, we have to re-implement it basically, which is a humongous pain. And for whatever, I tried everything. I spent like an hour specifically on this. We have this sidebar menu in CodeFun. It's like a multi-tiered nesting stuff's going on in that. And I could not, I could not do, I couldn't, whatever it was in purge CSS that was not understanding that I didn't want to purge that style, it, it wouldn't do it. So that it wouldn't work. Yeah. I've, I've got a theme that I bought for, for go rails and I'm like, uh, I just want to rip it all out. But the problem is I, I would like to move to tailwind, but then I've got to rewrite every single thing in the entire app, you know, every view, all of that. And yeah. I don't want to do that. So I, I started it once and then I was like, good Lord, there's so much HTML to change that it just was like for a trivial benefit. Meh, I don't know. So I, I gave up on that too. But the, that theme had the same thing. I think every theme 
ends up the same way. The, the way to sell your theme is to add every feature you can think of, which means add every JavaScript library you can think of. And then at the end of the day, you're like, there's this giant bloated theme just because you're selling the like, oh, we've got you covered. If you need this random feature, we got it. Don't worry. Yeah. There's a bootstrap theme from Bootstrap's like website in Hungary. Mm-hmm. And I guess all their themes use Gulp, but it's been, it's a nightmare for me to get it to work in Rails because, yeah, like there's all these random ven- like JavaScript vendors, right? Like, yeah, I can just install these with Webpack. Like, I don't need to bring all this in and then have these huge builds, but yeah, yeah. I, I threw out all of the JavaScript from the theme I got because it was from Bootstrap's store too. And I think they had like an Angular setup and then something else and whatever. And I was like, screw it. I'm going to like basically get rid of every JavaScript feature unless I need it, which I think I got away with. Like, And it's, and it's annoying too because there was like one feature where there's a... Uh, in the sign in and register links or whatever, or the forms, it, there's a field for your email and there's an icon that like needs to be the outline applied to it through JavaScript because they didn't do the HTML very well and like inset that icon. So then <laughs> there's like a few little snippets of JavaScript to like go apply this outline around that. And I'm like, are you guys serious? Like you're making themes, but. You just didn't do the CSS to to like put this in there for me. So yeah, that kind of stuff I'm like losing my mind on with that. And I'm like, I just want to throw it all away and start from scratch, but I also don't want to spend any of that time doing that work. You yeah. reminded me of Caleb Porzio that created Alpine JS on LaraCast. He is doing a uh, series of videos creating Alpine JS from scratch, which is pretty sweet. So he's going to walk through the whole process of like building that, which I think is going to be real fun to watch. That's cool. Yeah. I've gotten rid of a lot of JavaScript from that theme. And a lot of our JavaScript dependencies, like Nate and I have just slowly but surely been moving them out because before I came in, you know, they were playing fast and dirty, like just shipping things. And there's a lot of dependencies in there that I'm like, either it's not being used at all or it's being used in one place or it's like a clipboard like package. We had like three or four clipboard packages. And I was like, what the heck? And Nate was like, oh, I didn't know this was here. He's like, hold on. He comes back like 10 minutes later. He's like, okay, I rewrote it in stimulus, delete all of them. Oh man, that's, that is funny. I. I was doing, I think I rewrote in stimulus a clipboard thing recently, but I was looking at Firefox's docs and like the exec command, like the copy JavaScript uh, command is like marked as deprecated. And that's like the actual example on the stimulus docs too. So as I was doing that, I was like, I don't even know if my code's going to work for very long if I do this. So I, I think I ended up leaving it, but I was like, surely I'll find out before this is like removed from the next Firefox, hopefully. But yeah, I wonder what's going on with that. Because it seems like I can understand there's security concerns of you visit a website and then it like reads whatever's on your clipboard and, you know, puts its own spam links on your clipboard or something. You know, I'm sure that's a a concern, but... Yeah, that's and it's funny how easy you can get like multiple libraries that do the same thing in your app, especially when you have lots of dependencies. It's quite quite easy. Before we move on from Bootstrap, I gotta say the worst part about Bootstrap for me personally is that every time I have to go to Bootstrap's docs because their classes make no freaking semantic sense whatsoever, and I'm spoiled by Tailwind, I have to look at this freaking carbon ad on their homepage every time because sometimes for some reason my ad blocker like lets them through sometimes I'm like I don't want this. <laughs> yeah, I, it drives me nuts remembering all the 
the flex class names, like justify content between, but then like that one's pretty descriptive, but display flex is like D flex and they're all like inconsistently named for each thing. And that's like the best part about tailwind is like every class name is predictable, you know? And it, once you learn the format of colors, you always know that you can put a color name and 100, 200, 900, whatever afterwards. It's so, so easy to go change something because you don't have to think about it at all. So that is, it's like, I can't wait for the new Tailwind UI components to, to drop. I'm just like itching for those every time that they post, you know, screenshots on Twitter. There's some really good Tailwind UI extensions for VS Code. Like the, they have IntelliSense, which is amazing. They have ones where you can go straight to the doc, like Tailwind docs, like type something in your search bar in VS Code and go straight to the Tailwind docs for it. And I like the, my favorite one that I found is one that will sort the Tailwind classes like according to like this, like, you know, ranking algorithm it has. And I, I oh, really like that. That is cool. Cause I try and keep them consistent too, where it's like, you know, mm. color before background color. And, you know, you do your margins first and your padding second and whatever, have some sort of consistent ordering. Cause then if you don't do that, it's just scanning your classes and getting angry. But that is, that is a really cool idea. I really like that. You'll have to let us know what the name is. Yeah. Those are the little things that might... Uh, I don't know. I'm still like going to use Vim all the time, but I wish I had that stuff in Vim. You know, I, I don't know if I'll ever move to VS Code, but it's, it's just like way slower than using Vim. But the plugins are awesome. I'm installing that one as we speak. Oh, yeah. Real quick. <laughs> the other day, Nate called me on like a Saturday or a Sunday because he asked what I was doing. And I said, nothing. And he said, can you help me with this yarn issue? Which I couldn't. Just throwing that out there in case anyone now thinks I know anything about yarn. But he had VS Code open. And I was like, what? What is happening, Nate? Like, is this what you do on the weekends? Like, like business on the weekdays in Vim and then on the weekends he's pulling out VS Code. That's funny. I I don't know. I, I picked up Vim just because it was like a great way to force myself never to touch the the mouse. And I could use the same editor on, you know, a server and my computer. But yeah, then after switching to it, it's like super fast and then trying to like sit and wait for a file to open or little Things in, in VS Code or Atom or whatever just like drive me nuts. Just like fraction slower, but with everything you do, if it's a fraction slower, it just feels awful. But I don't know. Jason, you said you were working on some action tech stuff before you started recording. What's, uh, what are you up to? Yeah, so I've been working on field help again. One of my users called me this week and was asking for some you know, just standard things, right? Like table support, videos, embedding, like with iframes. And so I was like, yeah, no problem. You know, I'll get that done. And so figure out how to do it with the tr- with tricks using the like attach or like insert attachment, which inserts basically like according to tricks, like it's just a single character, like place in line, but it's an attachable object. Mm-hmm. And so that was working. And then every time I would save it, it would just, I'm using action text, like behind the scenes, like it, you know. Yeah, um, that's the trick. <laughs> so it would just never save it to the database. Right. And that's because you didn't have a SGID on it or whatever. Yeah. And sorry, because it, for anyone that doesn't know, I spent all day today and yesterday working on my RailsConf online talk about Action Text. And every single custom attachment you want with Action Text has to hit the server and be represented by some model. And then 
That way it can render it out and make sure that it's valid, safe HTML the user put in. So you have to you have to build routes for all those things. They have to return JSON. You got to write JavaScript to do the insert. It is a like way more complicated than it seems like it would be to add, you know, video embeds, but it's probably the only secure way to do it because all that stuff has to be signed by the server because otherwise I could just tamper with that and, you know, just say, hey, instead of this video, why don't we load up uh, user number one instead and print him out? So it is weird. So you are moving off of action text to make stuff a bit easier because it feels like if you're trying to support a lot of features, to action text, it is a lot of tedious work to go add support for each of those things. It feels like I have to because there's no documentation on how to add your own types because I don't think they let you right now. Like I was reading that same, there's a thread that you kind of just set all this in already. Uh, it's in GitHub somewhere. And like somebody wrote a gym that'll let you define your own types, but like it bypasses all the validations. So like that's not really what I'm looking for. What do you mean types? Because see the action text has this action text uh, attachable model or in- module that you include in your model. So like, one of the things I'll cover in this RailsConf online talk is like YouTube embeds. So the JavaScript, well, the way I have it set up it is like Basecamp, where if you paste in a YouTube URL into the link option, it like regex matches and says, it looks like a YouTube video. Do you want to embed this instead? Which will trigger an Ajax request to the server, create a YouTube instance of the YouTube class that I write, which is an action text attachable model. And then it will, that attachable gives you the signed global ID thing. So that's what action text uses to verify the attachment is valid or usable. And that SGID is a string. It's signed, so you can't read it, but the, the raw GID global ideas are just like GID colon slash slash app slash class name slash ID. So it uses that to figure out which model and which ID. So it will just call like if it was GID slash uh, app slash user slash one, it would just look up user dot find one. So you don't need to define types really your you're defining, you do have to define a class in Ruby that's attachable that can have a find method to look it up. So you should re render then. So the way that stuff renders is fun. There's two methods because for videos, for example, this is a good example of, of why there's two methods. You don't want to actually embed the YouTube video in the editor because that's going to be really frustrating to work with. So you want to just embed the thumbnail. So there's a, on action text attachable, there is a two tricks content attachment partial path. This is the longest method name in the world. But that was a method I fixed in the original release of action text, I think. Because that will say, here's the partial I want you to render if you're editing for tricks. So that one for YouTube, you would just embed an image tag. But then on the regular partial path, it will render that out when it renders the content like normal. And that partial path, you would want to display the iframe to YouTube then. So you have control over that. But if you're doing like a user mention and you want to display maybe their avatar's little circle and then their name, you can use the same partial for both of those because you don't need a unique thing in both cases. And that was what I fixed. I made the default for the tricks editor partial to match the normal one. So it was consistent in both places, but sometimes you need different things. So I don't think you should need a gem for any of that, but it is not a 
it is not a simple thing to just go add custom attachments to, you know, it is way more complex than I would like it to be, but it's also a fairly complex feature. So I don't know that it's a whole lot or something that you can make a whole lot simpler. Does that make sense though? Yeah, no, it makes sense now. How you do it. There were things like, I guess in that thread, somebody had mentioned like adding like a horizontal row or horizontal rule and yeah. how there's like a built-in, I use the term type, like there yeah. is a built-in attachment. Support. Yeah. And so that makes sense. I guess it just also, all I want to do is store an iframe. And so literally all I want them to be able to do is just put that in there. But now I've got to go save that. Yep. On in a database record, come back, bring back a signed global ID. And then yeah. they, at that point, the user might not even persist that record. Mm-hmm. Like, yep. It is uh, complex for sure. Because the, the YouTube thing, I can get away with not saving in the database unless I need the latest YouTube embed code or something. Because mm-hmm. if I just pass in the YouTube ID, they have a URL that you just drop that ID in for the uh, thumbnail and for the embed code because it's like youtube.com slash embed slash ID. So for those, I just have it, you know, as a, a thing in memory. So then rather than, well, the YouTube ID is like the, the ID I use in the global ID for the lookup. So, you know, if you're, if you're doing something like that, then yeah, you don't need a, you don't need to store it in the database, but for more complex stuff, yeah, you do have to. So you end up doing like a find or create in your controller or something. So why and, wouldn't I just use like tiny MCE? Yeah, well, the, the problem is like, okay, let, let's take the user example. And you'll see this on GitHub, actually. Like they use Markdown for their stuff. If you at mention someone or an issue or something and that user changes their name then or their username, then you still have the comment with the at, you know, at Jason Charns, but it doesn't link to Jason Charns anymore because you change your username. And that was hard coded text. The cool part about action text is that it's it knows the the database ID or whatever, because it's in the signed global ID. So it will always point to Jason Charns, whether or not you change your avatar, your username, your name, your email, it doesn't matter. Database record still exists. It will always be accurate, you know? So we can display much more rich, like always up-to-date content that way with action text, which is like the real magic of it. Because then... Like in Basecamp, they display the avatars. That is not an easy thing to do unless you do something like this, which makes it really like trivial. So it's kind of awesome, but at the same time, like it's not a simple feature. It's not like you're just parsing Markdown and replacing a at mention with a link like they do in, in GitHub. But there's no, you know, like if, if GitHub wanted to add that functionality and you change your username, they have to look through every single comment ever made to see if it includes your, your your old username and then do like a find and replace in that comment to update it to your new us- username, which would be a nightmare to do. So that is solved with a bit of complexity where you have to have your server sign the database ID. You know, So now every time you attach something, you've got to take care of that by talking to the server and asking for it. I do need to look through the horizontal rule and see how that works. Cause it might just be like a generic, like we're an attachable thing. We don't care what ID you gave it, but we'll always look up the same thing, you know, and you create a new instance of a horizontal rule or something. But yeah, I'm kind of curious how that one works. Cause it's kind of a, a unique case. Cause it's, it's gotta be treated the same way as these more complex things, but it's like, how simple is a horizontal rule? Why wouldn't it be able to do that? It's out of the box. Yeah, I just kind of feel stuck between like, anytime someone asks for anything other than the basic tricks, 
functionality. They basically have to rewrite thing problems that have been solved for many years, like putting a table in an editor. Like I don't, I just don't know. Like it's, it's trade-offs, I guess. Do I want the ability to like deep leak things like that? Or do I want to have to write an extension every time? I just don't know. Yeah, it is. Yeah. I don't really know what you would do for, for tables. Cause that would be, uh, that would be quite a bit more complex, I would imagine. Or there may be something with tables that you could, like, you may need to extend. Or th- I know there's a list of like allowed tags and stuff in Action Text that are ones that it will look for. Cause, like, anytime you do an Action Text attachment, if you're doing a table and it's one of those, then it's gonna need an SGID. It's just how, like how it works. So it's going to remove those and then try and replace them. But yeah, for a table, if you could make it so that the table could just be inserted and then ignored and not treated as a attachment, then that would be fine. But there's not enough. Like most people's frustration with stimulus and the same thing goes for tricks is like, we just need more examples and action text too. It's like, there's not a whole lot of information. There was nothing until I started digging through it and figured out the global sign global IDs for custom attachments. So that's been the like GitHub thread in my, you know, Go Rails video that everyone's been referencing. But yeah, I thought I would have to give a talk on it, you know, because I like it's a really cool feature if you want deep linking of different records in your database and enrich text, then that's the only way you can really do it. But you need a lot more people using it to make things like tables and stuff easily supported. Because right now, yeah, you would have to go build it completely from scratch. And I don't even know the best way to go about doing that. So yeah, I want to, I don't think it's a great solution for everything right now. It could be, but you know, it is it's fairly complex. So the the one really nice thing is that like User mentions are really easy to do now, like tribute JS from Zurb, really, really good JavaScript library, really easy to use. And it will, it supports spaces, which is like a tricky thing too. Cause that one's like, you want to autocomplete and the user might type a separate word in the past, like with the at symbol parsing. Well, yeah. And Markdown, how you, how would you do that? You would have to search every word. What if the user's name is three or four words? You know, like, then how do you know when to search and stop if you're going to try and link that to some user account? The only way you could do that really is if it, the username was one word and then you would separate by a space or something. So it lets you do a whole lot more this way. But yeah, there's... A lot of complexity with that. You got to make requests with Ajax, the server. You're going to have special endpoints for every one of these different things. You know, it is, it is a cool thing in, in, in theory, but it seems like it's similar to where active storage is. Where it's like, well, the one use case is simple ish, but you know, there's a lot more it could be doing, but it does not work that way just yet. So I don't know. Hopefully the, talk will get some more inspiration and more people using it. But I feel you. I don't know how willing I would be wanting to use that on if I needed to add tables and that sort of thing. Unless I really wanted to contribute back to Rails, then I might use it. But otherwise, yeah, you're probably better off right now using a a different uh, WYSIWYG and just foregoing your like deep linking because it's really kind of like Wikipedia style linking yeah. between records, you know? So, yeah. The other thing too, on the point about like doing it and trying to like upstream it is like, I don't know that they want all those features at the same time. Like, so yeah, they may not want to, they may not want to maintain them in the core, rails core, like right. at view component is now removed because of that. Like, you know, so yeah, you may have to build your own gem and extend stuff, but that also might be good. And it might eventually become super useful and well done that they're like, okay, 
we don't mind pulling this in to Rails core or whatever, but because really the all the foundations are there. There's just like, is it re- like, do we really need some weird exception to add a horizontal rule in our editor? That seems like complete nonsense. So once if those things get ironed out in the core, I think that will be way better. But for now, oh my gosh, it's really cool in theory, but it's not that fun in practice. Yeah, that's all I got on it. Um, I, it means now, though, that if I switch away from it, I've got to go through and manually get all the attachments and content out because they're all in those records. Well, if you just render the stuff to string, it'll output all the HTML for you. So it, it will... Because the cool thing, too, that Action Text does is those attachments are all... The reason why your um, custom attachments without an SGID don't exist is that it strips out that content and minifies it. Because there's no sense in storing like the YouTube iframe if you have to replace it with a different image tag for the tricks editor. So they minify all that for the attachments. And then really the only thing it keeps around is like the SGID, other metadata. But yeah, if you were to just write out the... So if you have like a post model and it's called body or whatever, then you can say post.body.toString because the body will give you an action text content object, I believe, which knows how to convert to HTML and stuff. So when you call toString on it, it will load up all your attachments, render them in line where they belong and all that. And it, it will use the... There's like an action text content helper that you can use for rendering that out or is what it uses to render that stuff out. So you would then have all your HTML, which you could go, you know, store in just a text column or something and switch editors. So probably not a bad idea to do that as a maybe two-step process of, you know, add your text column, convert everything, verify it all works, don't lose any of the old data and then get rid of it later. Yeah, so my only question about that, I guess, and this is just a fundamental lack of understanding of active active storage, is it generates like a unique key or whatever to read it from S3. Does that not expire? What, the active storage stuff? Like the URL, so like if I upload an image, Mm Mm-hmm. And I'd call like 2S to get the raw body and it, you know, it has the image tag with the link to the image. For an active, you mean an action text? In action text, I've attached an image. Like I've okay. dragged yeah. that, and it's uploaded to active storage, right? Because. Yeah. Yeah. That's the other thing. It's all built in. Yeah. And so when I get that URL back, like it's, I assume an SGID or what, however it, creates the key to read it. Yeah, it would just be in a regular active storage URL, I think. That wouldn't like expire anything like that. Like No, and all the SGIDs, so like signed global IDs have the option for expirations because they're signed. If you could tamper with that, then there would be no real <laughs> expiration. So those for action text don't expire otherwise like your image upload would just disappear after 30 days or something. So those, the attachable module adds attachable SGID as a method, and that will create a signed global ID for, it gives it a name like or purpose for attachable with no expiration. So those don't expire. The other downside is that because you've signed all of these things and they're in your text content, if you ever need to rotate your secret, good luck because you're going to have to rewrite all of your action text content to find and replace those. And I don't think that's going to be super fun either. But I think some people have talked about there's a, a way to add a second fallback secret. So you could switch to a new one, but also keep your old secret and then let it slowly convert those over time. Yeah, it would be a process to do a rotate for sure, but it's probably going to be the same thing for more than just action text. I would imagine, you know, all of your, it's one thing if you had to like log out all your users, 
wouldn't be the worst thing in the world. But you know, when all your content breaks, that would be pretty bad. Like all your tweets would just disappear or something. That would be strange. But yeah, I guess that's another example. Like uh, Twitter, you know, I think it used to be more naive on Twitter if you at mentioned someone, they just like match the usernames and link to the person. It may be smarter now that it will reference this database record for the user and display whatever their current username is. And, you know, that, that stuff is cool, but if you don't absolutely need that, it's maybe not the best tool to use right now. Yep. The entire conversation just flew straight over my head. <laughs> well, I'm going to be in the weeds of it until I get this talk finished. And got most of it, I did a practice run earlier, but it was only like 20 some minutes long. So I'm going to try and go a little bit deeper in explaining how some of this stuff works. But we will cover YouTube embeds, which I know has been like a, a very, very requested action text example. So be nice to cover that for everybody and user mentions. But yeah, I don't know. That maybe should be something that I work on more on the side or something, try and contribute back to that. It needs a lot of work, it seems like. I'm pretty excited for your talk. So the have we talked about I know we've like briefly touched on it, but we like there's a date now for the Rails talks coming out, right? It's like the first day of the conference. Or what would have been? Yeah, I think so. I don't really know anything other than like talks are due April, mid, mid, middle of April somewhere. And I'm sure that gives them time to edit and, you know, export and upload to YouTube and get them all scheduled or whatever. But yeah, I'm just trying to get mine done. I was going to try and do a screencast style because this is my native environment, you know, uh, rather than giving a talk. but there's just so much code to go through for all this because you've got to go build your tricks, you know, customizations, your JavaScript, your Ajax request, your controller, your model, your views. Here's a lot of moving parts and there was no way I was going to pull all that off. So I ended up falling back to, I built a demo of all that stuff. I will link to at the end of the talk and go check it out. But the Talk's all going to be like a keynote presentation and extracted snippets of the the core of all that functionality. But yeah, there's it's going to be fun. I think they said there's most of the the conference speakers agreed to do an online version. So I'm excited to see that. Should just be like kind of going to the RailsConf uh, like normal if you're just attending. Well, I guess we spend most of our time in the hallway track. So it's it's going to be different this year for us. <laughs> we'll just fire up a Zoom, do nothing for a week. Yeah, we'll all have yeah. it, have YouTube streaming in the background, but ignoring it the whole time. <laughs> That's Too kind good. of funny. I had never, I had never done hallway track until I met y'all. Yeah, I used cool. to go to talks more, but I feel like more and more I don't get anything out of the talks, and I get way more out of chatting with people. So the last year was like attended three talks in three days, maybe four, maybe, maybe five talks, but yeah, not a whole lot. So are we going to have a viewing party? Is that what we're going to do? Yeah, maybe Let's that's, it up. maybe that's how we start the Ruby online meetup. That's actually a really good idea. Uh Oh, I think we lost Andrew. Such a good idea. He disappeared. He's like, I got to go. This is a great idea. Later. <laughs> well, I well, think we're at our time limit anyway. So yeah. Well, yeah, that would be a fun place to start the online Ruby meetup. So maybe that'll be an idea. I know Andrew is posting, trying to get more people to. Oh, he's back. Yep. Um, Jiggle the power saying, cord by incident. <laughs> I was just saying you posted on Twitter earlier today about collecting more um, feedback from people about what. How often, what time, and that sort of thing to try and get this online Ruby meetup organized a bit more? Yep. I am starting to finally move forward a little bit with it after some initial 
kicking, dragging. I don't know. I I have this brain where I'm like, okay, I want to do this Ruby meetup. And then I slowly walk through every possible like thing I'm going to have to do, like regardless of whether or not I'm actually going to have to do it. And then I'm like, at the end of it, I'm just exhausted thinking about it. I'm like, Ugh. well, now I don't want to do the thing. But no, I'm, I'm buckling down. I'm starting to work on it. I'm very hopeful that we get some good responses from the survey. I, if anyone takes it and has any feedback, obviously this is going to be like what this episode's like two weeks away. I guess it'll get posted probably or a week. You guys yeah, live in uh, some dirty. Yep. So oh, man, we were at the Ruby Blend, and then Nate and I did a podcast alone uh, because Ron couldn't be there. I hadn't slept in like two or three days. And it's basically one long rant of me mispronouncing people's names. <laughs> that sounds like a good one. No, um, I, I did not ship it. We'll have no. to, I guess we'll have to include a link to your survey in the show notes, but it might also be a week old by the time it comes out. So hopefully people will find it beforehand. But uh, yeah, and feel free to ping me on Twitter or email me um, with your ideas. There's the repo is up there. Like feel free to submit issues. I would like to like update the copy a little bit, but copy and documentation is like the thing I'm the worst at. I'm actually currently getting roasted for lack of documentation by an unnamed person from the bootstrap core team. (laughs) Um, (laughs) But yeah, I, I, I'm getting there. I've I've talked to a couple of people because my initial like worry was like outside of the fact that like, you know, I really don't want to use Zoom. I'd really like to use some different product, but it might be... I had someone offer to donate a Zoom room and some other people have said they would donate one as well. So it might, might just have to be a Zoom room and that's fine. And the other thing I was worried about is like, I... I've never done this. I'm not great at speaking in general <laughs> because I don't think before I talk. And I was like, I don't know how or why, but I'm just kind of convinced that like, I'm just going to screw something up and this is how everyone on the internet is going to turn against me. But I am <laughs> stopped worrying about that. I've talked to a couple of people, gotten some good advice as to what not to do and to how to you know make it like a good community from the beginning. Cause like the last thing I'd want is to, to do this and like, it builds like a little community, but that little community is just like toxic dude bros. And like, it's just like an echo chamber of like annoying people talking about guns and Bitcoin and fish. So like, I wanted to just, you know, have that very in like the front of my mind that like, I, like you have like one chance to build a community in the beginning and however you decide to do that is going to kind of, you know, dictate moving forward, not only like the community, but like your image in the overall community. And I would hate to be known as the guy who created like a toxic cesspool of like annoying Ruby developers. Yeah. Just leave that to Reddit. We don't need another community like that. <laughs> yeah. But I have to say, I've said this several times, but like the Go Rails community is, I feel like such a, great community like you've done a really good job of shepherding that Uh, yeah it is some of the coolest like most helpful people at all it's awesome so yeah it it is not an easy thing but i think we are out of time so we should should wrap this up i will talk to you guys next week we'll have a fun episode then should be a little different we'll add a, a new person to our panel which we haven't done for a little while so yeah i'm excited all right I'll talk to you guys later. Later. This podcast is brought to you by our friends at Linode. With 11 data centers worldwide, including their newest data center in Sydney, Australia, enterprise-grade hardware, S3-compatible storage option, and their next-generation network, Linode delivers the performance you expect at a price that you don't. Get started on Linode today by going to linode.com forward slash remote ruby.